Hello Horror Hounds, Nicolas Cage is back and he's bringing the Cage rage. This is how an awful lot of people are going to be welcoming his new movie. But it's a really reductive take on something that's a hell of a lot more interesting and involved. Friends, we need to talk about Mandy. Aside from what Nicolas Cage brings to the table, and we will talk about that later, Pretty much every review that I've read of this talks about Mandy as uh, a heavy metal album cover come to life. And that's kind of accurate. Again, that's one facet of this extremely interesting film. And I think it was uh, an intentional facet, this extremely stylized piece, very specifically set in 1983, draws very deeply upon the imagery and sort of narrative themes and tropes of heavy metal albums, uh, fantasy novels, almost maybe a sort of Dungeons and Dragons type quest mentality. If I'm going to go with that metaphor, I'd actually say the film begins uh, as a psychedelic or prog uh, album and then moves into metal and then perhaps death metal. Essentially, any film that starts with a track by King Crimson is all right with me. I mean, I don't want to downplay the heavy metal and fantasy sort of and prog elements of this because it's a film that features something called the Horn of Abraxas for crying out loud. Helping add to this metal album come to freakish life is the doom-laden electronic score by the now sadly uh, late composer Johan Johansson. And it segues from this sort of uh, synthy electronica into uh, a similarly plodding guitar riffs. And by plodding, I don't mean boring. I mean, think of the chugging sort of a Black Sabbath intent and then towards the end when the drums kick in uh, you're really barreling towards the conclusion it's if such a thing exists it's it's ambient death metal uh, and it's just one of the many tools uh, used to sort of lull you into a, a suggestive state an almost sort of trance-like state so that the movie can wash over you and have its wicked way with you you're either going to be on board or you're not. This is going to be an extremely divisive film. Some people will hail it as the best movie they've ever seen. Other people will say it's an absolute pile of garbage. I think after one viewing, well, when we get to the end of this, I'll tell you the conclusion that I wrote a couple of days ago, and I'll tell you what my feelings are now after writing up these notes and thinking about it for a couple more days. One aspect that will absolutely turn a whole ton of people off and draw a whole other ton of people in is the pace. This movie is slow, deliberately slow, long takes, sequences of slow motion, crossfades from one shot into another. A very languorous film, especially for the first snap. It may well be far too slow for some people. Don't think that Mandy is a wham-bam affair like Evil Dead 2 or Ash vs. Evil Dead. Although it, it does have a feel at times of an Evil Dead 2. It's, it's an art house Evil Dead movie. If anything, Mandy is a tone poem. It's a meditation on a certain mood. It's absolutely not an action film. The story, such as it is, is remarkably thin. You have Red and Mandy living in a sort of uh, idyllic, secluded uh, lifestyle. They found a sort of element of equilibrium and peace with one another uh, in the Pacific Northwest, in the shadow of the Shadow Mountains. Into that life comes, in a, in a Winnebago, a sort of cult-like post-hippie uh, group and the, the, the lead figure of that cult, Jeremiah Sands, notices Mandy and orders his acolytes to kidnap her, obtain her for him. It is his destiny, their destiny. She's a special person, he's a special person. It doesn't go well at all. Mandy's killed and then Red sets out on a, a road to revenge to kill uh, everyone involved. But, but, but that's it. It's a straight narrative, no twists, no turns, no hurdles. 
it's very, very straightforward, which leads me to believe that if there's any juice to this, given that there's no real story to speak of, then what we're being presented with is a world full, steeped in symbolism. One of the ins into this that you might want to consider are the planets and uh, the Greek and Roman uh, myths of the gods that the planets uh, are named after. Mandy and Red have a brief conversation about which is their favourite planets and she talks uh, about uh, the myths associated with uh, Saturn. So you might want to delve into that for, uh, uh, for some sort of meaning. Certainly, definitely to my mind, Red. He's called Red. You've seen the trailer. He spends the, the entire second half of the movie covered in blood, so he is literally Red. He's clearly Mars. He is clearly the god of war. There's alchemy it's in the first act. It uh, heavily speaks of uh, the elements, fire, water, air, earth, right up to the point where Red uh, forges um, his sort of more metal than metal sword axe, whatever the hell you want to call that beast, which is also in the trailer. And you might argue that the blacksmith's forge is one of those sort of mystical places where all of the four elements come together in, in an act of sort of alchemical creation. So this silver weapon uh, that he, he constructs for himself is certainly rich with occult symbolism and alchemical symbolism. Drugs is clearly another through line of this movie. It's clear that Red from the start is a recovering alcoholic. He refuses a, a drink right at the start of the movie. And when he starts on his revenge path, so when we move from the first portion into the second sort of revenge fueled section of it, he starts that journey, that quest, uh, by uh, going into the bathroom and getting a bottle of vodka that's clearly been secreted away so he's a recovering alcoholic but not such to the point that he doesn't have a bottle of booze hidden somewhere in the house uh, with a phenomenal scene that some people again will be reductive about and just use it as fodder for gifts it's a sustained shot of cage in the raging howl of grief and anger and it goes it goes from sort of sad to funny to really horrible, all in one take, all in one shot. It, it drew laughs, but it's an astonishing piece of acting, completely non-verbal, seeing the utter desolation and grief of, of a man, a man falling back onto his, his old habits with the loss of Mandy, his stabilizing influence. At the same time, he's uh, realizing he's backsliding but realizing that that's necessary to fuel and to turn the anger again and forge that alchemically into grief into the rage that will sustain him for the rest of the film i mean it's it's phenomenal mandy herself her name clearly is a euphemism for mdma and uh I can clearly see the suggestion at the start that their life together is is one of sort of uh, blissed out peace. She is the drug that he has used to replace all of his previous destructive vices into something more creative. And she similarly clearly has a past and she gets something from this relationship as well. There's the use of uh, liquid LSD on a number of occasions to open the doors of perfect, uh, perception, cigarettes, cocaine. Uh, Red Face is a nightmare that's uh, a symbolic and real fear amongst, I guess, reformed addicts that the life that they've carefully pieced together is perhaps an illusion, is definitely fragile, and that at any time it could crumble and they could succumb to their, their, their past hungers. Once he succumbs and becomes the beast he needs to, to fulfill his own mission, the movie, which is always psychedelic, always trippy, always drug-like, moves from a sort of uh, blissed out psychedelic haze into its full-on sort of death metal section. I mean, these words that I'm using are either going to indicate to you, this sounds like wank, or I really need to see this film. By the time the tiger is introduced, the film has become the cinematic equivalent of those t-shirts of wolves howling at the moon. 
you you are either going to throw up your metal horns or you are going to throw something at the screen and leave. There is no middle ground with Mandy. So let's talk briefly about Nicolas Cage. I've already a little while ago put up uh, a video called Let's Hear It for Nicolas Cage. So I'm not going to reiterate my defence of the man's career, uh, which is now being thankfully reassessed in the context of Mandy. And thank God, because the man's... <laughs> Not a joke, he's just doing some really interesting things that sometimes work and sometimes don't work. And who else but Nick Cage is going to be able to pull this off? I've been thinking over the last couple of days, I mean, yeah, there, there are other actors who would be able to uh, equip themselves well in the role, but to really excel, to really go to those extra places, right, to the tips of uh, the fingers and the toes and just be as expansive and then as contained as uh, as Cage is when, when he can do it and when he's really on point and when he really believes in a project, there is no one else and really no one else but Cage could have pulled this off so successfully. There will be people who come to see this just for Nick Cage and they will go away happy even if they just want to see Nick Cage doing wild and crazy things uh, and that's all they want to take from the movie, they'll be happy. Um, it's not solely Cage's film though, Angela Riseborough as Mandy is uh, ethereal, haunting and uh, wonderful really for a story that unfortunately yet again sort of turns on the death of a girlfriend or a wife to engage the heroic male into his uh, revenge story which is, okay, it's a bona fide uh, sort of story trope but it's so overused here at least in, in uh, Mandy we spend a goodly enough time with Red and Mandy and get to know enough of her to know why she's so good for him so bewitching to Jeremiah Sands such a loss once she's gone it's a really it's a it's a, a, a haunting sort of magical she's she's quite fey she does seem to have a foot in in, in both worlds. Some might say she has her head in the clouds, but uh, I, would, I would maybe put it another way in the context of this film. She has a foot in both worlds. I mean, it's set in the Pacific Northwest, and uh, whilst it gives me Evil Dead vibes, it also weirdly gives me Twin Peaksy vibes. You know, the owls are not what they seem, and there's something strange in the woods. Linus Roach plays the cult leader, a sort of Manson figure, a failed sort of hippie folk singer, way past the roach end of the hippie dream in 1983, definitely on him and his group are on some sort of massive LSD come down of the soul. You know, the age of Aquarius didn't happen. <laughs> How uh, are they going to square that with their beliefs? Well, as it happens, uh, <laughs> he believes himself to be some sort of messianic figure he's a superb counterpoint to uh, to Cage really menacing um, but uh, weak and pathetic when he needs and has to be and that's why I can forgive Mandy the, the fridging uh, the killing of Mandy as the, the catapult the jettison for the narrative because what happens is when you take her out of the equation. These different forms of masculinity start battering each other and it's it's not healthy. It's exceedingly unhealthy and if anything I think it's perhaps a, a deconstruction of uh, that rather than saying this is a, a grandly heroic quest that Red now sets himself on. So in conclusion, my first conclusion as I promised you, this is what I wrote a couple of days ago. Will I ever choose to watch Mandy again? I'm super glad I saw it. I want to own it. I will get it on Blu-ray, but I wonder whether it's the kind of film that will just sit on the shelf until I have a guest over and sort of say, well, do, you want, do you want to see something weird? Do you want to see a really crazy film? And then we'll put uh, Mandy on. Whilst writing up my thoughts on the film, that morphed into a real need to see the film again. Now that I know it's not an all-out action adventure, now I know it's not a Kill Bill type revenge story, 
I really badly want to watch it again so I can dig deeper into that symbology and try and reassess my relationship with the film. Bottom line, if you've been waiting all of your life to watch a film uh, where Nicolas Cage sets a man on fire, decapitates him, then uses his burning head to light a cigarette, then your wait is over, my friends. I suspect non-horror fans might get much more out of this than horror aficionados. There's horror in there, there's bloodletting in there, a plenty. It's handled very well, but it's almost, it's, it's perfunctory. Perhaps it's hard for the violence to stand out because absolutely everything else is turned up to 11. But I dearly, dearly want to see it again. Now that I know it's not just a, a straight horror film, now I know it's not just an exercise in excess. I want to watch it again to figure out how I truly feel about it. I mean, one thing's absolutely for certain. It's a trip. So if you've got two hours to spare, watch it in the dark. Uh, no ambient lighting around because it won't help. Mandy is an absolute trip. You just get to decide whether it's a fantastic flight of fantasy or a really bad trip, <laughs> a bad batch of LSD. Uh, I can't make up my mind for you on that. All I can say is you, you, you will not have seen anything like it. Like that, I can promise you.